So there's this moment in the Bible where Jesus declares that God has forsaken him. He asks the question, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? To forsake something means to abandon it or to desert it. So if God did that to Jesus, why wouldn't he do it to me? Why wouldn't he do it to you? Can we trust God as someone who won't abandon us? This is a huge question, and it's one I want to tackle today as we read about the most important day in history, the day that Jesus died on the cross. We're in Mark chapter 15. I'm going to read the whole passage to you, then we're going to talk through it. You need to stay around and listen to this. It says, And when the sixth hour had come, I'm in verse 33 of Mark chapter 15. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And a curtain of the temple, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger and of Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. That's the scripture that I wanted to read today. Um, and we're going to go back and look at some of these things and answer that very critical question. If God abandoned Jesus, will he abandon me? So starting out, you see something really amazing happen. It says, when the sixth hour had come. So back then they referred to hours as like hours since the daylight started. So you can assume that about that time of the year, which was probably most likely around April, early April, it, it would have been from about 6 a.m. until about noon would have been the sixth hour. So that would have been six hours of daylight is what they're referring to. And it says there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. So it got dark. We can see in other areas of the Bible that it says that you could even see stars in the sky. Some people think that this might have been an eclipse, like a solar eclipse, but that actually wasn't possible. And the reason why that wasn't possible is because the Jewish people base things on a lunar calendar and basing their dates and their festivals on lunar calendars, they often put full moons as the highest event. And so that full moon would have been the Passover. And that means that since Passover is happening right at this time, that we're about two weeks away from the moon being in a position to be between the earth and the sun. In other words, science does not allow for a solar eclipse in this moment. There are some recordings of historical events outside of the Bible that also record this darkness, which is really cool because it wasn't something that was just isolated to the Bible. It actually is historically recorded other places, but there was some people who thought that this date coincided with April 3rd, AD 33, and there was a recorded lunar eclipse on that day. And in a lunar eclipse, the moon turns sort of like a reddish color because the earth casts a shadow on it. But that wouldn't have been this either because a lunar eclipse would not have made the sky that dark. So, What's going on? We know that a solar eclipse lasts a maximum of seven and a half minutes, seven minutes and 29 seconds to be exact. And that's well short of 
three out three hours. So could not have been a solar eclipse, could not have been a lunar eclipse. So the question remains, what was it? And instead of saying like, well, I wonder why that's even possible. We probably should ask ourselves another question of why is it not possible? God controls the sky. He controls the heavenly bodies. He controls light and darkness. He is referred to as light in the Bible. In fact, when John introduces Jesus, uh, it says, behold, the light of the world. And that is Jesus coming in the world as uh, the Lamb of God, the light of the world, the one who's come to take away the sins of the world. All of those things are Jesus. And in this moment, I believe that God is making a statement. He's saying, I sent the light of the world into this world for you guys, for people, for humans, for this example, so that you could see the light, so that you could have it in front of you, have this man walking and dwelling among you. He is the light of the world. And you're about to extinguish that light. You're about to destroy the light of the world. And so just as a example of what you're doing, I'm going to show you what it's like to live in darkness. You know, he did this back in Egypt. One of the plagues was three days, actually, of darkness. It says a darkness that could be felt. So God can do this. This is not something difficult for him. He turned back the sun in the book of Joshua. He controls the heavenly bodies. And in this moment, what God's doing is he's saying, you want to extinguish the light of the world? Let me show you what that feels like. And he shuts off the sun for three hours from noon until 3 p.m. Says, you want to feel what it's like to not have light? I'll show you. This is a miracle. This is not something that can be explained by an eclipse or sun's position and the moon's position in the sky. God did this and he did it on purpose and he did it to make a point. It's not a storm. It's not anything but God shutting off the sun because we were about to destroy the sun. S-O-N this time. His sun. So... That's what's going on in that first part, and I think it's worth mentioning and worth talking about. But then, it says, at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice. So that darkness is either there or just, just stopping again, uh, and the light's coming back on just long enough to focus back in on the, the light of the world, Jesus. And he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So I don't know about you, but... Uh, that, that's a little bit, like, I don't like it, right? I don't like the fact that it seems like in Jesus's greatest moment of need, like when he needed God the most, when he is on the cross, in his most pain, in his weakest state, close to death, he really needs God right now, the Father. And uh, instead of feeling like he has God there with him, he feels forsaken. He feels abandoned. He feels deserted. He feels alone. Doesn't sit well with me because I don't want to feel like God's going to leave me in those moments where I'm the weakest, where I'm the most tired, where I'm unable to find the strength in myself. I need him then. Is he going to abandon me too? So that's the question. Uh, and I want to say that in this moment with Jesus, he in a very real way is abandoning Jesus. So this is not some misunderstanding. It's not some thing that he didn't say and it just got translated wrong. Like, no, Jesus said that. And the reason why he said it was because in that moment, God's wrath was about to be unleashed on him and God had to pull away from him. That unity, that that relationship, that connection that Jesus has always had with his father has to go away for a second because God is about to send his wrath onto Jesus for the sins of the world. And so there is a very real sense of separation happening here. 
where God is literally pulling himself apart in order to fulfill the righteous requirement of the penalty for sin. Uh, it says, I wrote that this is what Jesus feared the most. When he talked about going to the cross and when he's crying tears of sweat, drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, this is the moment that he is fearful of, that he does not want to have it. This is what he wants to avoid at all costs. It's not the physical pain. He knows that's going to be bad. It's the spiritual separation from his father that he is terrified of. It's taking on the wrath of God for sin on himself. And there's a Bible verse that speaks to this. It's 2 Corinthians 5, 21. One of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. Memorize this one if you haven't. It says, For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And what that verse is saying is that God made Jesus the recipient of his wrath on sin, right? And the reason why he did that is because Jesus taking on our sin allows us to take on his righteousness. It says, that's what that verse is talking about. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. Jesus had never sinned, but he took on the sin of all of us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So we might be looked at by God as righteous, like Jesus was, because he took on our sin. He took our place. He took the punishment that we deserve so that we could get the reward that he deserved. I've been watching The Hunger Games um, a little bit lately. Started watching it because someone was watching it at, at, at school and uh, and I didn't. I got to watch a little bit and was like, I need to watch that series again. But in that series, there's like the moment where uh, Prim, Katniss's little sister, her name gets pulled for the reaping and she's the one who's gonna have to go and likely die in the Hunger Games. But her sister, out of love for her, volunteers to take her place. She says, I'll go instead. Her sister's far from perfect, by the way. Not a perfect person. But what she does out of love for her sister is she says, you can go home, you can go free. I'm gonna go and take your place. And if, if I die, I'm, I'm willing to die for you. And, and so that's the type of thing so much smaller because it's one person and it's uh, a love for a family member. This is Jesus. And he's going to take on the wrath and the punishment and the sin of every person in the world to ever live, living and to ever live in the future. So it's amazing. It's a, it's a wonderful story and it's more than a story. It's what really happened. And it says here, uh, and some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. They misheard Jesus. They misunderstood him. They misrepresented him. And there are so many people that are still doing that to this day that say Jesus was something else other than what he was. He was just a teacher. He was just a prophet. He was just a good man. Jesus was none of those things. He didn't, I mean, he was all of them, but he wasn't just those things. He was the son of God. And God turned off the sun in the sky to show everyone that. And now he's still revealing it. Um, but wait, there's more, like the infomercials would say. Jesus was not only making a statement about how he felt and about how God's wrath was about to be upon him in this moment. He was also drawing his Jewish audience, his Israelite brothers and sisters, to a scripture that they all would have known. So back then they weren't making blockbuster movies. They weren't writing plays. Their knowledge and their studying and all of that, all of what they wanted to learn about and know about and talk about was scripture. For them, the scripture was the Old Testament. And by them, I mean the Jewish people. So there were certain lines and certain things 
Like when, when I say a certain line from a movie, you might know what line I'm talking about. So I might say, you can't handle the truth or you had me at hello. And you'd know what type of movie or what scene from a movie I was talking about, right? And, and the same was true for the scriptures for the Jewish people. So when Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It brings to mind Psalm 22. And I'm going to go to Psalm 22 right now. I didn't have it pulled up, so it's going to take me just a second. But uh, I'm going to go there. Psalm 22. Because I want you to hear exactly what it says in Psalm 22. Almost there. There. All right, I'm going to read you some verses. I'm going to skip over a few. You can go read the whole thing if you want to, but I'm going to read you some of them. This is the Psalm of David, by the way. Jesus is in the line of David. He's actually the promised Messiah in the line of David that was promised in the book of Samuel. Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. So this is David and how he feels in that moment, right? Uh, and he expressed his feelings to God. And then it says, so imagine you're a Jewish person and you are recognizing what Jesus just said. And you're like, hold on, let me go check that scripture. Because Jesus just said the same thing that Psalm 22 says at the beginning. And you're reading this and it's like, God, why have you forsaken me? And then it says in verse three, yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. And you, our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued, and you they trusted and were not put to shame. Okay, a little hope there, like maybe God's about to save him, right? Maybe this is going to happen. They're, God's holy. He saved Israel. It seemed hopeless for them, right? And then it says, I'm going to jump down a little to verse 7. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him for he delights in him. Wait a minute, that's exactly what was just happening. People were mocking Jesus. They were saying, save yourself, take yourself down, call to God, have him save you. And then it says in verse 14, go a little further. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. And my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of the earth. So now it's talking about how his bones are out of joint. And then it says, for dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircle, encircle me. They have pierced my hands and feet. Wait a minute. I can count all my bones. I can literally see his bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. All of these things are what Mark just described a little bit ago as happening on this day, in this moment. And Jesus is trying to point people to this, to this psalm, to the promise of God that this was going to happen to his anointed one, to his Messiah, to his son. And then I'm going to go down just a little bit further to verse 22. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel. This does not sound like someone who feels forsaken. This sounds like someone who is looking to praise God in the midst of their struggles and their tribulations. For he has not despised or bored the affliction of the afflicted. This is not for nothing. This is not for nothing. The things that I'm going through, the things that you'll go through in your life, God's going to use those things. And he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. When you feel abandoned, when you feel alone, God is there. He hasn't ignored you. He hasn't forsaken you. He's, he's hearing your cries. He's there. And it says, for, you, for from you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. 
Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you, for kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. That does not sound like a psalm of someone who is hopeless. It does not sound like a psalm of someone who feels abandoned. The answer to the question of will God abandon you like he abandoned Jesus is no. The reason why God allowed Jesus to go through what he went through wasn't to forsake him. It was so that he wouldn't have to forsake you. So that he wouldn't have to forsake me, desert me, abandon me, pour his wrath out on me and on you. That's why God did what he did. And you know how I know that? Because the very next thing that happens is proof that God did this for the nations, for, for his people. Because the next thing that happens, it says, and when the centurion, well, a little bit before that, let's go back one little more. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and cried his last breath. It says, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, top to bottom. In other words, no doubt that God's the one who's tearing this curtain temple. The curtain temple is what separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the people. No one could go in there, in this temple. God ripped that in, ha in half from above. That temple curtain was three inches thick. Impossible to rip with human hands. Impossible to tear. You wouldn't need machinery that they didn't even have yet to do that. So God ripped this temple from top to bottom, allowing his Holy Spirit to symbolically and very really as well exit that location and come out into the world. And we celebrate Pentecost on this day, which is the fact that the Holy Spirit came and fell on those disciples a little bit after Jesus uh, came to rise from the dead and walk and leave and go away. We have the Holy Spirit coming and resting on the apostles and then leading them out. So we have this example of God tearing the temple curtain and allowing that Holy Spirit to no longer be bound. It's the Holy Spirit age that we now live in. And then it says, then the part that I was going to read to you. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. This is why God did it the way that he did it. So that a centurion who just was a part of killing Jesus and hanging him on the cross would recognize that Jesus was the son of God. He just, he probably witnessed hundreds of crucifixions in his time as a centurion, especially if he's the one that's there at the cross. So instead of saying, yep, another job done for the day, he noticed that there was something different about this man, that there was something different about this time. He saw the sun go dark. He saw the words of this man who was not cursing and feeling sorry for himself and trying to get even or just unconscious. Most people would have been knocked out by then. Jesus is still alive, breathing, talking before he gives his breath, his last breath to God. And so it's a beautiful picture of what it talked about in Psalm 22, that the reason why Jesus came was to open up to all generations, to all peoples of the world, an invitation to know him, the son of God, and to be made right with God because of the sacrifice that he made. God's wrath was poured out on Jesus, so it didn't have to be poured out on us. God abandoned and deserted Jesus in that moment so that he could restore him, make him new, and so that he could have relationship with us. And not look at us as one who he would abandon, but look at us as one who he could restore because of the righteousness of what Jesus did after he took our place. That's the story of the Bible. So let's pray. If you want to take that step to know Jesus and to accept the gift that he's given you, then you can pray this prayer. It's not the prayer that changes you. It's the heart to turn from sin, to abandon, if you will, the worldly things and cling to God and Jesus and allow the Holy Spirit to lead you. So let's pray that prayer. God, thank you for today and for this truth of what happened in history, that this example is exactly why Jesus came. He came to die so that we could live. 
And God, I thank you so much for doing that. I thank you that you poured out wrath on Jesus as he voluntarily accepted it, but that it wasn't just you forsaking him or abandoning him, that it was you looking beyond this moment, that moment into the future where you would declare us righteous because of the death of, of Jesus. And because Jesus was God himself, he was able to resurrect, to come back, to walk on this earth again, and he still lives next to you right now, and he will come back again. And I believe that, God. I believe all the things that your word says. And I turn from my sin, and I turn to you. I trust you. I believe you. And I want you to send your Holy Spirit to lead and guide me. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, I hope you uh, appreciated that. This is one of the most important things that we can know about the Bible, that Jesus did die on the cross, that it was real. God didn't abandon him, and he won't abandon us, at least not if it's not for our own good and for something so much greater in the future. So if it feels like God's not there, if it feels like he's abandoning you, he hasn't because what came next for Jesus was resurrection. See, it's about being willing to give up our own life and trust him because he's worthy to be trusted. He's already proven himself over and over again. Love you guys. Have a great week. We'll see you real soon.